let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of uh, Math 1207. I feel like every time we see Natalie, she's in a different location. She's, she's like doing math on tour. I have to find good places to do math or else when everybody's distracting me, that's a mess. Like, that's so true, though. <laughs> I know. She's like, oh, pretty soon you see her. I'm on the Brooklyn Bridge doing Calc 2. Hey, I'm... Okay, all right. Uh, let's actually just jump into it. Before, yes, before, let me remember, uh, because this was an executive decision made earlier today based on an email that I got from a student. Um, so they're a little bit apprehensive about having a quiz tomorrow since uh, we had back-to-back -back classes and, and it was just, you know, it's midterms week. A lot of you guys are having midterms. So uh, they suggested that maybe we shouldn't have a quiz tomorrow. And I was like, okay, okay, we won't have a quiz tomorrow. So uh, during a recitation tomorrow, um, just use that as an opportunity to kind of review everything, I would say. Um, so I didn't actually write up the quiz, but I, I guess I can kind of tell you what I was thinking of throwing in there. So if you wanted to uh, see what I would have asked you on tomorrow's quiz, uh, well, basically, I was just going to, again, give you a list of improper integrals, ask you or not whether they converge, and it may or may not uh, need you to use the comparison theorem. Although probably, if I don't ask you what it converges to, probably the comparison theorem is the better choice. Um, if uh, I ask you what something compare, converges to, it means you can actually compute the integral and you should. Um, I would also ask you to just like uh, identify the formula for the trapezoid rule and the Simpsons rule. The trapezoid rule I already went through with you guys and Simpsons rule we're gonna go through uh, pretty much now. Uh, yeah, and ask you to just some actually to ask, ask you to actually do a problem on the trapezoid rule and using the Simpsons rule, uh, identify delta x, something like that. And maybe also describe a situation and ask you to tell me which method would be appropriate when it comes to approximation. So there are five total now. So you have the left hand rule, right hand rule, midpoint rule, trapezoid rule, Simpsons rule. Uh, they all have their own nuances. And I probably would have asked you to distinguish between them who would give an overestimate, who would give an underestimate. Um, which one is the best one to use in this scenario? That sort of uh, questions. Uh, I would also ask you about convergence of sequences, which I expect to get to sequences by the end of today. So yeah, that's the, the, those are probably the kinds of questions I would have asked on the quiz tomorrow. Um, um, so yes. because we're not having that quiz tomorrow, then is next Friday moving on with the material, or will that quiz be on like this material still. Does that as far as I know, next Friday is the actual test. Oh, am, oh, oh right. Am I am I mistaken? No, no, no. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So next Friday is actually test one, and so the test on Friday will actually cover everything up until Tuesday. So whatever I finish on the nineteenth is uh, what you should expect for the test. Um, anything that I cover on Thursday, you can consider it as a part of the bonus material, as well as what I will cover on the following Monday would probably also be in the bonus material. So the uh, test will only be like a 50 minute thing to fit into the recitation yeah, time? Yeah, I'm going to make it fit into the recitation time. But this time it's going to be all of recitation time. It's not going to be like half and you talk about it after. Um, but tomorrow's recitation, uh, look over everything, any issues you've been having with the past quizzes you can bring up, any issues you've been having with the current material you can bring up. Um, uh, I didn't really plan anything, so it will be somewhat informal. You guys have to come up with your own questions. But I will email uh, Professor Golick and let him know that that's the plan. Uh, so you guys should log in with Zoom uh, at the beginning of class with him and just think of it as a, a student uh, a student driven review session. You guys ask all your questions, all the little things that you got wrong and you're not sure why, anything that you're confused about, uh, try to get it cleared up. So that's the plan. I don't think I have any more announcements. So we'll actually just jump into it. Let me share my screen here. Let me make sure I can see the chat and everything. Okay. All right, so uh, let's jump right back into it. Uh, so we are looking at numerical integration, uh, kind of like integration from first principles, right? Going back 
harkening back to the days where we learned about the Riemann sum and we learned how to build integrals up using areas of rectangles. Um, so that, uh, the concept is actually pretty similar. So that's why I did a little bit of review here. So what you've known uh, so far was like the left-hand rule where we use the left side of the, of the uh, rectangles to determine the height. Or you can use the midpoint rule where you use the midpoint of the rectangles to determine the height or the right-hand rule where you use the right side of the rectangles to determine the height, right? So you plug in the x values that are on the right into the function that gives you the y value that hits the function and that's what you plug in. And then you pretty much, it was the sum of uh, essentially what these guys became. Uh, this one, for example, was the sum, uh, i goes from zero up to n minus one, of f of x i delta x. And that was an approximation for your area. Uh, this one was the area is approximately equal to i goes from 0 up to, I think we started numbering it at 1. 1 up to n of f of x i star times delta x, where x i star was just the midpoint of these intervals. And this area was the sum uh, I goes from one up to N of F of X, I delta X, right? So, it, and that was basically adding up length times width and adding them up for all the rectangles, right? So we've seen that before. The idea now is we want to actually use shapes that are a little bit more efficient than rectangles. So why use a rectangle that has a horizontal flat top if uh, my uh, curve is slanted? Why not use a rectangle with a slanted top? So that is called a trapezoid. And so uh, this leads to the idea of the trapezoid rule. And the idea is this guy is going to miss a lot less than the guy, than uh, one, all the previous rules. That being said, if we let n go off to infinity, they, they are all going to give us the same answer. But uh, the trapezoid rule would be expected in this scenario that I just drew here, would be expected to actually get you closer to the actual answer faster. So you'd have to add up less things. And that's always actually a good thing to be able to do. Um, it's not always good enough to solve a problem, but being able to solve a problem more efficiently is always something that is, uh, is needed. Uh, you go into computer science, this is a big issue, knowing which problems are NP hard versus NP easy, and just processing power is a big thing. So just because you theoretically know how to solve a problem, when it comes to the real world and you actually need to tell a computer to, okay, do this, process these tasks, um, it, it matters, right, that you are giving it in efficient instructions, because otherwise it takes too long, the computer might crash, whatever, right? So uh, the idea is efficiency, and trapezoids are... Uh, for things that are slanting up and down, they are, seem to be more efficient. If you had a horizontal function, then all of these guys would actually give you the same area exactly, no matter how many subintervals you get. But for functions that are changing, trapezoids might be better. We derived the area formula for the trapezoid rule, and that was that, and this is listed here. Um, just notice that uh, you take in, in, into account all y values from the leftmost and the y value corresponding to the leftmost endpoint to the rightmost endpoint, um, and you add these all together, the difference is you multiply all the intermediate value, y values by two, right? And that was, I, I showed you why that was the case, okay? Um, so that was the trapezoid rule. We'll actually do an example pretty soon. Um, now I want to talk about something else, uh, the area under a parabola, right? So to figure out the trapezoid rule, all we need to remember was a formula for the area of a trapezoid from uh, high school geometry. But chances are in high school geometry, you never learned about how to find the area under a parabola. That, unless you did calculus, that's more of a calculus concept. So it's not some straightforward, nice geometry formula. You actually need the calculus to actually do this nicely, okay? But the idea is the following. Sometimes our functions are very wavy. Right, so sometimes uh, I can have a function that's like And so even a trapezoid, yeah, it'll be a little bit nicer than a flat top rectangle, but you know what would be even nicer? Hey, parabolas, what you can do is if you're interested in dissect, finding the area from A to B, uh, you can dissect this into a bunch of little things. 
And what you do now is you, uh, like actually plot parabolas that pass through these points, right? And then in between here, I can construct another parabola, right? It's not a line. So for a parabola, we need, to, we need three points, right? And then I can draw a parabola here. And, you know, for over here, I can uh, construct another parabola passing through these three points, and I can draw a parabola here, and so on. And then I just find the area under these parabolas, right? Now, this it would be assumed to converge even faster than the trapezoid rule because the trapezoid rule still had straight edges and we had curved wavy functions. So maybe taking a function that was itself wavy would be a good idea, right? So the parabola is one of the most basic functions. This leads to Simpson's one third rule, as it's called. Um, and that's the rule that uses parabolas. But this idea can be extended. You could use cubics, quartics, quintics going all the way up and the formula would expand and change. But we're going to look at the one that uses parabolas. This is called Simpson's rule or Simpson's one third rule, if you want to emphasize. Um, yeah, so let's actually figure out how to get this done. Um, we can start with something like this. Uh, that's right. I didn't lose you guys, right? Okay, because one of my screens went blank, so I, I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't sure. Okay, so here's how we can uh, go about this. Let's actually figure out how to find the area under some parabola that is uh, centered in the x-axis where I have the points that I care about. Let's say this is x0 and this hits the coordinate x0 comma y0. Uh, then call this point x1, which is the origin. This hits the point x1 comma y1. It's called this part here x2. Bring this up. This hits the coordinate x2 comma y2. And the goal is to find the area under this parabola, okay? Um, and of course, if I can figure this situation out uh, where these guys are equal distance, let's say x2 is the number h and this one is minus h. If I can figure that out, then I can shift it along at any point and I can know how to actually get that done. So if I can figure out this situation, I can figure out all situations, that's the idea. And so let the parabola B, uh, let's call it AX squared plus BX plus C, because I want it to be able to apply to anything, okay? Uh, we want the area A. We want the area, okay? How do we actually go about figuring that out? Well. Calculus, uh, we know that the area is going to be the integral from minus h to h of our function. And so um, we all remember from Calc 1, the integral of an odd function across a balanced interval is zero. So we can actually ignore the middle term because that's going to just cancel itself out. Um, and so now we integrate, we get ax cubed over three plus cx between minus h and h. And so this is going to be ah cubed over three plus ch. That's gonna be plus an ah cubed over three minus and plus a ch. So this would become 2AH cubed over 3 plus 2CH. Uh, let's actually factor out the 1 third and the common H just to get rid of fractions here. So this is 2AH squared 
plus six C. Okay, so that's the area. Um, now I want to know that in terms of our X and Y values. So I'm going to use the fact that I, uh, of the center of how I centered this parabola and take that into account. So one thing I know is that P of uh, zero is Y one, I called it. Yeah, so at zero, the output is Y one. I also, I also know that that's actually going to be equal to the C value, because if I plug in zero into this, for X into this parabola, I would just get C as the answer. Now, of course, uh, my, if I plug in H into this, the output is going to be Y2. But I also know that that's what I get when I plug in H into the parabola. If I plug in minus H into the parabola, that gives me Y0. But I also know that that's what I get if I plug in H minus H into the general form of the parabola. What I can do is I can add these two. Add. Um, and so this would mean that y0 plus y2 is going to be equal to uh, 2ah squared plus 2c. And so I'm going to take that. Maybe I should use. I'm going to take this and apply it to that. How can I apply it to that? Well, this is 2a8 squared plus 4c plus, plus 2c plus 4c. I know the first two terms is just y0 plus y2, but I also know that my c is y1. So I'm going to apply that here. So this would leave me with h over 3 of uh, y0 plus y2 plus 4y1. Or in other words, uh, h over 3, y0 plus 4y1 plus y2. Um, notice what my h is. This is a sort of equivalent to me saying the delta x, this was the, uh, the distance on the horizontal, uh, the sub, sub intervals. And this would be f of x0. This would be 4 f of x1. And this would be f of uh, x2. So that's how I would find the area under a single parabola. I can actually just do this computation. Tell me three points that the parabola passes through. And I can tell you uh, what the area under those three points are. Professor? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't really understand why you eliminated the BX in the beginning of the problem. Uh, because it would be zero. If I integrated it, I would get BX squared over two. If I plug in an H and a minus H, they end up the same. Fundamental theorem of calculus would cancel. Okay. Right, but you can also, you could have known that from the beginning because uh, X is an, BX is an odd function. It's symmetric about the origin. And so for all such functions, if you're integrating from minus A to A, it always is zero. Okay, so we can put these guys together. So let's say I have my function over here doing its thing. And I have one parabola here. I have another parabola here. I have another parabola here. And uh, here's something to notice. I needed three points to find the error under this parabola. I needed three points to find the error under that parabola. I needed three points to find the error under this parabola. Um, in the first situation, my, and let's say I call this x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, uh, x5, x6. In the first situation, my area is going to be delta x over three times uh, y0 plus 4y1 plus y2. In the second scenario, my area is going to be delta x over 3 uh, times y2 plus 4y3 uh, plus y4. Uh, in the last scenario, my area is going to be delta x over 3 
times y4 plus 4y5 plus y6. Um, notice that the total area then is going to have this kind of form. Delta x over 3 is going to be a common term. I'm going to have my y0 plus 4y1. You're going to notice that I have a y2 in the first area and a y2 in the second area. That adds up to two y2s. Uh, then I have four y3s. Uh, I have a y4 and a y4 from the different areas, so that's two y4s. And then I'm going to end up with four y5s, then uh, y6. Okay. So notice the pattern that happened here. Um, it's a delta x over 3. And then uh, the first end point and the last end point, the y values are the same. But in the middle, I start at 4 and then alternate between 2 and 4 all the way down. Um, so it's going to start at a 4, end at a 4, uh, but alternating between 4 and 2 for the intermediate y values. This leads us to Simpson's rule, which is the guy here. So when you're wondering where that formula comes from, let me actually minimize this so you can actually see everything. This leads to Simpson's rule. Uh, to approximate the area under the curve f of x from a to b using areas under parabolas, um, this is the formula. Delta x is the same, b minus a over n, that you're used to. Now you take the endpoints of the y values, and for the intermediate y values, you multiply them by 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, alternating, starting with the 4. And you start with the 4 because of what I derived earlier. Um, you don't need to know the derivation, but I just thought I would instead of just tell you this is the formula to show you where it came from. And so that's where it came from. Um, another thing you should notice with Simpson's rule is that n must be even. And why must n be even? You would notice that I would need three points for each parabola, and that takes up two subintervals, right? So there are two subintervals between under each parabola. So each parabola I, I put up, there need two subintervals to span that parabola. So I'll always have an even number of subintervals. Um, and so n has to be even for the Simpson's rule. But that being said, that's what it's going to look like. All right. Um, these are guys that can approximate the errors under the Simpson's rule, like how far you are from the actual answer, depending on what you're doing. I'm not going to focus on this. I'm not even going to ask you about this either, but I thought I would just put it there because it's actually useful. It's good that you know that these things exist because at the end of the day, when you're approximating something, it's not just good to have an approximation. It's always good to know how good your approximation is, right? So, um, you don't want someone to be like, uh, you know what? Uh, you know, a, a few years ago, I, I lent you a lot of money when you were down on your luck and you said you'd pay me back. Well, uh, how much do I owe you? Approximately what? Like uh, $500 when you really lent them 10,000, right? The, approx the, uh, the, the approximation, how close it is to the actual answer is always an important thing to worry about. So it's not just like, I want to approximate an error. You want to know how good your approximation is. Like you want to be able to get to a reasonable degree of accuracy with the answer. And these are the equations that would help you do that. Um, so you should know they exist. And yeah. Um, by the way, I do uh, have a summary of all these techniques and these uh, approximations in that PDF right there, which you'll be able to see. It's also on the class website. That just links you to the class web, the, the PDF on the class web page. Um, what we're going to do now is just basically uh, do an example. So this is what you're going to need to know. Um, I'm, I put in the midpoint rule, but I'm going to skip that because, again, that's Calc 1. You should know how to do that. Uh, so we are going to now look at uh, applying the trapezoid rule and the Simpsons rule to approximating uh, the error under this curve, sine x, which we know how to do it. Um, but let's actually just do it using these rules so you can see what you will need to do. The process is actually super similar to Calc 1. In that regard, there's nothing new here. The only thing is you're using these two new formulas at the end of the day. So the as with Calc 1, let me do part B. As with Calc 1, the first thing you want to do is find delta x. Delta x, remember, uh, delta x is b minus a over n. Here we're given n is uh, 4, 
B is pi, A is zero. So that's the first thing. Uh, two, find the Xi, all the X values that you would need. Um, personally, I like to draw a picture, uh, but however you can do it, that's, uh, that'll be fine. So the interval is from zero to pi. I know I want to cut it into four equal pieces because my N is four. And the first part is always called X zero. The last part is the Xn, which is in this case, X four. So this will be my X one. So this will be my X one, my X two and my X three that I'm going to plug into the above foremost. Now, how do we find that? Well, you add the Delta X. So you start at the left endpoint and you add Delta X and then you add Delta X and then you add Delta X. You just keep adding Delta X. Um, so your Delta X in this case is pi over four. So when I add Delta X, I would get pi over four. Here I would get two pi's over four. Here I get three pi's over four. And here I get four pi's over four, which is pi. So those are the Xi. So this here is your X1, that's your X2, that's your X3, that's your X4. And now you just plug into the appropriate formula. So we know we want to use trapezoid rule. I'm going to plug into the trapezoid rule formula. So in calc one, at this point, you'd be plugging it into like the midpoint rule formula or the left-hand formula or whatever. Uh, plug into the appropriate. formula. So in this case, I want to estimate it with uh, the trapezoid rule on four rectangles. Right? So that's how we denote it. So the area that I care about, I'm going to approximate it with the trapezoid rule on four rectangles. What is that going to look like? Well, delta x over two times uh, f of x zero plus two f of x one plus two f of x two plus two f of x three plus f of x four, right? By the formula that we had earlier and you have in your notes at this point. Uh, and now we just plug in. Our f was the sine function and our x's are there. So our delta x is pi over four. And here I'm just going to have f of zero plus two times f of pi over four uh, plus two times f of pi over two plus two times f of three pi over four plus f of pi. So this is pi over eight. This is sine of zero plus two times sine of pi over four plugging in two times sine of pi over two, uh, two times sine of three pi over four, plus the sine of pi. Uh, what's sine of zero? Zero. What's sine of pi over four? One. I'm sorry, rad two over two. Rad two over two. Sine of pi over two? That's one. Sine of three pi over four? Rad two over two again, and then zero. So this gives me pi over eight um, plus, this amounts to two plus two rad two. Or in other words, that's uh, pi over four times one plus rad two. And that's the approximation of the area. Okay, that's it. So again, the principle, same as calc one, Riemann sums really, same three steps. The difference is step three, you have a new formula to plug things into. Um, which I derived for you. So similarly, uh, problem three is going to be very similar. 
So now if I want to use the Simpsons rule, approximate with Simpsons rule and n equals uh, four subintervals. The idea is the same. First, you find your delta x, uh, b minus a over n. Then you're going to find your xi. Uh, I know I start at 0 and pi. I want to split it into four equal pieces. I keep adding pi over 4. Then I know my formula. My area is going to be roughly the Simpson's rule approximated on four, which is given by delta x over three. Uh, so this is going to be f of zero plus four f of pi over four plus two f of pi over two plus four f of pi over three plus f of pi. And now I just plug everyone in. So this gives me pi over 12. This is sine of zero plus four sine pi over four plus two sine pi over two plus four sine pi over three plus sine of pi. And so that's zero plus four times rad two over two plus two plus four times rad two over two plus zero. And so that would be pi over 12 times, uh, that's is four it, rad two. Is the second, is the second one rad three over, rad three over two and not rad two over two? Because pi over three, the sign is rad three over two. Uh, it shouldn't be pi over three. It should be three pi over four. Okay. And we have that. So that looks something like uh, pi over six times one plus two rad two would be that approximation. And that's it. That's that's you applying Simpson's rule and trapezoidal. Rule. So you'll need to know how to apply those, which means you need to memorize the formulas. Applying them comes down to the same strategy from Calc 1. Find your delta x, find all the xi, plug into the right formula. You're done. Um, then um, I won't ask you to derive the formulas, but I, I would also ask you if I were giving you a quiz to uh, tell me, OK, uh, of the midpoint, right hand, left hand, who would, who would you expect to give you an overestimate or an underestimate or things of that sort? Like I'll, I, I would also ask you some graphical questions. But in terms of calculations like that you'd have to actually work out by hand, uh, you just need to know how to apply it like this. Um, and it's just, but it, this topic is more important as a conceptual topic to know how you would go about approximating certain things. Um, because that's actually important and understanding in principle how to do it, even though, yes, in real life, you don't, you, if you want to approximate an integral like this using any of these rules, you just plug it into a calculator. Um, it's good for you to understand the concept that went behind it. And I, I actually have an example in a later lecture that we'd bring up with that where um, doing it by computer just wasn't working and you can actually do it by hand and get the answer, which is crazy. Uh, and it was a very computational question. Let's, uh, so knowing how to do it is actually pretty important, if at least in principle, but probably otherwise as well. So that's the Simpsons and trapezoid rules to be combined with your midpoint left hand and right hand rules. So that's that topic. Any general questions before we move on? Was that clear? Are we okay with, uh, with what I did here with these problems? Yes. Okay. 
All right, so I uh, actually want to talk about a different topic today, uh, and it's going to be a little, this one is not going to be bad. It's going to be an easier topic just to finish off the day. It's going to be sequences. So we have covered, not that it's not going to be relevant moving forward, but we've covered all the new things that I want to teach you about integration. So that's the integration part of the class done, finally. It's one of the, it's one of the biggest parts of the class. It's also probably the hardest part of the class. Um, series, I would say, is the second hardest part of the class. Um, but after that, we'd have two more phases. And those guys are, relatively speaking, easy, I think. Students tend to find those guys easier. Um, series is a weird thing, um, because series, I know there are students who have a lot of trouble with it. But it's actually a lot easier than integration. Uh, I think it's because they just build it up in their mind as something new. And it's scary. Uh, but if, if you follow the principles, uh, it should be, they should be no problem, actually. You will have to remember about your limits for these problems as well, uh, which is, I sent you emails about that and all that stuff. So just like that. The, the thing that is going to be similar to the last phase of the class integration phase here is that, again, I am going to teach you a bunch of different techniques, and the challenge is going to be knowing when to apply which technique. Um, it's just that those techniques are tend to going to be easier. Uh, the computations tend to be easier. So you, once you really focus on the technique, you should be able to execute them properly. Um, so the, the difference is just knowing the techniques, really. The first thing, though, is sequences, which is a really important and big topic. However, we're going to just give it the very basic bare bones treatment uh, because we're only covering sequences in order for them to be useful in our treatment of series. So the, the main focus of this section, this phase of the class, is series and their applications. However, to talk about series, you really need to know about sequences. A lot of things that, uh, for series are defined in terms of sequences. And so you really should know what a sequence is. Uh, but yeah, that being said, let's actually jump in. So it's like a whole new, uh, we're having a clean slate. We're starting over. So just shake off the last section. OK, integration, you have a little breather. Not that it's not done. We are going to still be needing integration. But for now, we're starting afresh. OK, and we're starting with something called sequences. So I'm going to give you the very basic definitions, build everything from the ground up, let you know what we're dealing with, um, and should be fine. So there are many rigorous ways to deal with sequences, but we're going to keep it very informal. So you see right here, I have a fuzzy definition. What is a sequence? A sequence is a list of numbers in a definite order. That's it. The numbers are called the terms of the sequence. In general, a sequence can be a list of anything, but for us, it's a list of real numbers in a definite order. Definite order basically just means um, the next person in the sequence is determined. Like, I can determine. It's a very deterministic list. Like, I, there is some process by which I'm choosing the members of this list. Right? So it's not just like a random list. Let me just take a list of things. Right? You think of a sequence when the list is very deterministic. Right? Like there's a way to get the second term, a way to get the third term, a way to get the fourth term. And that way is understood, um, if not very easy. OK, so that's it. A sequence is just a list in a definite order. Right? For us, we're going to deal with list of numbers. That's what's going to be important for us. So here are some examples of sequences. Here's a list of four numbers, minus 1, 3, 7, 11. Here's another list of a bunch of numbers, OK? Here, because the list is finite, there are only four terms. We call that a finite sequence. These guys are very important, but they're not going to be the focus because not the focus. Why? Because finite sequences and what we want to do with sequences is stuff you've been doing your whole life. It's really not uh, necessary, right? So essentially, the things that you would do with a finite sequence, you've been doing since grade school. So that's like adding, oh, add 1 plus 15 plus 17 plus 13, right? That's like you adding a finite sequence of numbers. That's what that is, right? So that's how you can think of that. Um, but so it's just a finite list. Uh, we're not going to focus on those guys. Infinite lists are much more uh, important. So this is an infinite sequence. Uh, we'll focus on these. And you notice that the ellipses indicate that there is a pattern that continues. So I put dot, 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 because 
the list never really ends. Um, I just go on and keep applying the process to determine new terms. Um, so uh, we can actually name sequences, uh, usually with uh, lower uh, case letters and subscripts. Um, I mean, as it's written here, it's kind of weird. Normally, you'd write it like uh, a n, and there would be a little like n equals one down here, and then infinity up there to say it's an infinite list. Or I can write uh, a n n equals one down here, and then some number up there if it's a finite list. So, for example, I can call this list. Uh, so I can call this list a n where n goes from one up to four, because there are four things in the list. I can call this uh, sequence bn, where n goes from one to infinity, because it never ends, right? The actual terms are also labeled like that. Um, so the first term I would label like an a1, a2, a3. So this is how I would write out that list. So for example, in the first sequence above, I can describe it like this. I actually wrote it down for you. And where an is this formula, which means this is how I'm determining the list. It has a definite order. I had a reason in mind for listing things. You'll notice that if I take a1, that is like if I plugged in one into this guy, that gave me minus one. Then my a2 would be if I plugged in two into this guy, and that would give me three and so on, right? So there's a formula that I was thinking of when I was writing this list. And I can actually write down the terms. I can name the terms. So this is the A1 term, and this is the A2 term, and this is the A3 term, and that is the A4 term. Okay, so we usually name sequences with lowercase letters and subscripts, and each term in the sequence is named by the same lowercase letter and the subscript without the squiggly brackets around it. And the subscript tells you what position you're in. So the first number is in A1, the second number is A2, the third number is A3, so on and so forth. So it's just a list in a definite order where I can say there's a first guy, a second guy, a third guy, a fourth guy. And I have some rule in my head about how to get the next guy in the list. Once you have such a list, that is list is called a sequence. Uh, the second one is this. Uh, does anyone know what that second sequence is? Zero, one, one, two, three, five. Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci it's the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci sequence. Very famous sequence. A lot of people geek out on this sequence. Uh, you can have you can have a whole lecture series on this sequence alone. It's all over the place. Uh, we won't get into it, but it's the Fibonacci sequence. Starts out with a zero and a one, and then to get each new term, you add both of the previous terms. So notice here. That's what I said. Uh, the first. Uh, term is a zero, the second term is a one, and to find every new term, I add two of the previous terms. So there's a definite way to go through this list, and it's described this way. By the way, the any list that is described in this way, we say the def definition is recursive, or it's a recursive definition. This means that new terms are computed based on old terms, right? So the Fibonacci sequence is recursively defined here, where I told you the two terms that started off, and then each new term is based on you making computations with the previous terms. Um, this one up here, where I just gave you a formula, is just called a closed form, right? So this, so this is called a, a closed form. And this is called a recursive form. So I can describe the list in a couple different ways. Those are the two main ways, okay? Um, I already mentioned this here. Your A1 would be the minus one in the first list. Uh, your A1 would be the minus one. Your A2 would be the three. Your A3 would be the seven. Your A4 would be the 11, et cetera. Another very uh, important way to think of sequences is as functions. So I can think of a sequence as a function, but it only works on the positive integers, right? So uh, you can see in this table here, N, I can think of N as the position in the list. Fn is the output uh, or the member of the list. And I can just think of that output as a function. So when my input is one, the output is zero. When the input is two, the output is one. When the input is three, the output is one. When the input is four, the output is two, et cetera. Right, so I can actually write it as a list of functions. I can think of a sequence as a function where the domain is actually the set of positive integers. 
And again, this is for our specific use. Uh, you can define sequences much more abstractly than this. But for us, just think of it like that. It's a function where uh, the domain is the set of positive integers. So when I plug in a one, I get zero. Uh, and when I plug in a two, et cetera. Um, and when you think of it as functions, you can start to do a lot of other things that we know with functions, like take limits. Uh, so one thing that's very important when it comes to sequences is talking about the convergence of a sequence. Um, what does it mean for a sequence to converge or, and how do we actually compute it? So let's say I have a sequence a n. This definition is very important. Probably want to actually like, take a snapshot of that. We say that an infinite sequence, so this is a, a definition that applies to an infinite sequence only, finite sequences don't converge. Uh, we say an infinite sequence converges to a real number if the limit as n approaches infinity of the term of the sequence gives me that number. If no such number exists, we say that the sequence diverges, right? Um, this includes the possibilities of L being infinite, plus or minus infinity, or the limit just does not exist in general. Um, notice here uh, also, oh, I, I did type that down in words here. Uh, we can use this notation, or I can just be lazy and just write the limit of a n equals L. It turns out that n equals in n approaching infinity is the only reasonable, sensible limit to take when you're talking about sequences. No intermediate limit is going to actually make sense. And I'm going to illustrate to you why in a bit. So whenever I'm talking about the limit of a sequence, it is always the limit as we approach infinity all the time. So even if I'm lazy and I just write LIM and I don't indicate what are we approaching, it should be known that I'm approaching infinity. This is the case for sequences, right? So um, yeah, I can talk about the limit of the formula that describes the terms of these sequences. And if that gives me a real number, I say the sequence converges to that number. Otherwise, I say the sequence diverges. Okay, so um, let's actually go through some examples uh, uh, of actually computing these. And while doing those examples, I'll kind of explain to you why it's always limit as you approach infinity. It doesn't really make sense to do anything else. Professor? Yes. Would you say like the Fibonacci sequence, for example, diverges? Yes. Because the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger, right? So as you go to the list, the numbers go up and up and up. So if, you're, if you could describe this by a formula and take the limit, the limit would go off to infinity. Um, it doesn't actually make sense for this to talk about the limit because the limit doesn't go to infinity. There are only four things. Um, it also doesn't make sense to say the limit as you go to four either, and we're going to talk about that uh, in a bit. So let's look at this here. Uh, essentially, what I want you to do is the, to determine whether the following sequences converge. If they converge, tell me to what? If they diverge, just let me know. Uh, so here is a sequence. It's an infinite sequence. n goes from 1 to infinity of a n, and a n is the formula 1 over n. In other words, I am creating a list, i.e., I am creating a list, a n. How, how do I construct members of that list? Well, by a formula. Starting at n equals 1, I'm going to keep plugging them into 1 over n. So the list starts at 1, then a half, then a third, then a fourth, then a fifth, right? So this is a list, and I can keep going. The list is going in a definite order. I know exactly how to find all the terms. It's a sequence, okay? Now the question is, does this sequence converge? Yes. Yeah, what does it converge to? Two, I'm pretty sure. To two? Uh, no, I know it's not right, but I know it converges to some little number because I just remember this. Okay, well go back to the definition. Oh, doesn't it convert, uh, converge to E? No, what is the, look back at the definition. <laughs> To so zero. Don't just throw out random guesses and try to remember what you did in some previous class. Start from the ground up. That's the definition. It converges if the limit as n approaches infinity of a n equals l. If l is a real number, that's what it converges to. Okay. This sequence, 
an equals one over n. What does that converge to? Zero. Zero. So if I want to know a sequence converges, all I do is I find the limit of a n. In this case, that is the limit of one over n. As n is going to infinity, I don't need to write because it's a sequence, it's obvious. The answer is zero. So this sequence converges to zero. Okay. Now let's actually illustrate this. Um, and while we're doing that, we'll see why the infinite limit is the obvious limit to take. Let's say I'm actually plotting this function. Okay, so let me put n on the horizontal axis and let me put a n on the vertical axis. Okay, now my inputs are just uh, integers, right? So it starts at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera, right? Now at one, what is the output? Well, A1, as you see in my list, it's one. Then the next output is a half, then a third, then a fourth. So the first one starts, the output is up here. It's at, uh, it's at one. At two, the output is at a half. At three, the output is at a third. At four, the output is at a quarter, and so on, right? These guys, you'll notice that they start getting outputs that are smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So here's the thing. Could I ask you, for example, what is the limit as n approaches two, right? Let's say I want to approach two. Is that possible? Well, no, because there's a gap. Right? There's nothing to the right or left of that point. I cannot get arbitrarily close to two, right? So it actually doesn't make sense for me to talk about the limit as n approaches two, because I can't get close to two. Even if I were to be able to talk about a limit, the answer will always be does not exist for every intermediate point. I can't talk about approaching any intermediate point. I can't approach four, I can't approach five, I can't approach eight, I can't approach 3011, I can't approach any intermediate number because I have a bunch of isolated points. I cannot get close to the left or the right of any individual point. However, I can sort of imagine a curve connecting all of these dots. And that curve kind of indicates a trend. And I can talk about, well, what is this trending towards? That is a sensible question. Um, and I can talk about, in the long run, how is this sequence behaving? That is what's called convergence. If the sequence in the long run has a very predictable behavior and it levels off at some constant, we call that convergence of the sequence. If this does not happen, or the sequence goes off to infinity or negative infinity, we say the sequence diverges. So while I cannot approach any individual point, I cannot talk about what's happening as we go off to infinity, as I go off far, far, far to the right. What, what is the outputs, right? These guys on the y-axis, they can get arbitrarily close together, um, but on the x-axis, they can't. Um, so on the vertical and horizontal, right? So on the horizontal axis, I'm not allowed to get arbitrarily close to anybody. But on the vertical axis, I am. So it actually makes sense to talk about the infinite limit as opposed to the um, any other limit. Also, I can clearly see from this trend that these numbers are getting closer and closer to the output zero. They will never actually reach the output zero, but that's what they're getting closer and closer towards. Okay, and so that's what that sequence converges to. Talk about this one. I just saw something over here. Okay, so let's look at this one. 
Uh, what does uh, does this sequence converge? No. No. Uh, why? How do you know? Because the limit at n approaches infinity of a sub n is infinity. Right. This is just or the limit as we approach n. That's infinity. So a n a n diverges. Okay. And again, you can imagine this one. When it's one, it's one. When it's two, the output is two. When it's three, the output is three. When it's four, the output is four. If you look at the trend, you realize that things are going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Um, it's not gonna settle at a constant, it diverges. Now, this is a very important type of sequence. Minus one to the n. Uh, what does that list look like? First of all, let's start there. Uh, what does the list look like? Negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one. one. Right, negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one, one. Okay. So it just keeps alternating between plus or minus one. It's, that's a very important thing that we need to get to do, to be able to do. We need to have some structure for alternating signs. And uh, minus one to the n will do that. And we'll, we'll actually get back to that later on. But for now, just know that this is the list. It's a list in a definite order. I know exactly how to find the next guy if you tell me the previous guy. Um, or I can just start from the very beginning and count. Like if you tell me, oh, the, what's the seventh guy? I can tell you for sure it's minus one. Like, or, or, plus, uh, yeah, minus one. And so, right, it's a definite order, it's a list. Um, does this converge? No. No. How do you know? Well, you can jump in by taking the limit. It's always what you do when you want to tell if a sequence converges. Uh, what would you say is the answer to this limit? Just does not exist. Yeah, it's, it's literally just does not exist. There is no meaningful answer that you can write down. And the reason is, Uh, this guy just alternates, right? So there's a, there are a lot of points. There's an infinitely many points where it hits the value one. There are also infinitely many points where it hits the value negative one, um, but it never settles. It keeps jumping up and down between the two, right? So you can't say the limit is one because no, the moment you say it settles at one, it will jump down to minus one. You can't say the limit is minus one. The moment you settle at minus one, it's gonna next time jump up to positive one. So you can't say it's settling to either of these numbers. It's not settling to anything in the middle because there is no output in the middle. Um, so this is just jumping up and down. There is no limit, right? For the same reason that limit as x approaches infinity of sine of x doesn't exist. It keeps oscillating. It doesn't settle at any number, okay? So that one actually diverges as well. Look at this last example. I'm not gonna draw the graph for this one. I'm gonna draw the graph for the others. Does this converge? First of all, uh, do we know what the numerator is. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. What is this? Factorial. 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 Right. So it's not like I'm shouting, N, 
No, it actually has meaning, right? It's not, it's not an exclamation. It's n factorial. Uh, how is it defined? It's just n times n minus one times n minus two all the way. Right. Uh, so it's the product of all integers from one up to n. Uh, for n a positive integer. For reasons of convention, uh, we define zero factorial to be the number one. Okay, so that is the only sensible thing that will make the rest of the math consistent and make our formulas work out in reasonable ways. Um, there are other reasons as well from probability and statistics. The factorial tells you the number of ways you can arrange things. And so when you say zero factorial, that's kind of saying, how many ways can I arrange nothing? Well, there's one, but just don't do anything. Like there's one arrangement of nothing, right? So there, there are a lot of uh, principled reasons for which zero factorial um, makes sense to be one. So that is the definition. So for example, if I, asked, if I said five exclamation, it's really five factorial. It's not just someone shouting five at you. And this is uh, five times four times three times two times one. 120. And that's the number of ways that you can arrange five things in order, by the way, just an FYI, if it comes up in probability. You won't need to know that in this class, but uh, that is. So if you have five things to put in a list and you want to find all lists in all possible orders, there are 120 orders. There are 120 ways that you can order things in a list of five things. Um, so that's what that is, right? That being said, tell me about this uh, sequence. I defined a sequence like n factorial divided by n to the n. Does it converge? Wouldn't it converge yes. to zero because the bottom's growing faster than the top? Right, so remember from our limits discussion uh, that n to the n grows faster than n factorial, a lot faster. So if we look at limit of a n, this is the limit of n factorial over n to the n, and this is zero, because it's, uh, it's bottom heavy, right? Um, the n to the n overwhelms the numerator. We know that because of, uh, uh, because we know log to the base a of n is less than or equal to n to the a, less than or equal to a to the n, less than or equal to n factorial, less than, less than n to the n. Right, so your a is one. Okay, so we know that order. So whenever these guys are competing against each other and we're going off to infinity, n to the n will win the battle against n factorial. Um, there's another way for you to see this. Uh, another way that you can notice here is n factorial over n to the n. This is like you're taking n times n minus one times n minus two times, going all the way down to three times two times one over, this one is just multiplying n by itself. And if you kind of group these guys, you'll realize that as the n gets large, these last parts here go to zero. They start off being close to one, but they get worse as time goes on. Um, and so the n factorial over n to the n would approach zero as my n gets huge. But again, if you remember your limits concepts, then it would be clear that this would converge to zero. Okay, uh, yeah, the last example reminds of an important concept in Calc 1. Yeah, that, that was this guy that I was talking about.
which if you go through the materials that I sent you about limits, I discuss this in those uh, resources. Okay, some properties of uh, convergent sequences. I underline convergent sequences because I've, I've seen the mistake it's not a rampant mistake, but I've seen it often enough to make sure to highlight it now, um, because these, it's very important that you understand these rules do not work. They are not true. They do not apply in general if your sequence doesn't converge. If the limit goes to infinity or negative infinity or does not exist, then these rules aren't true. You can't assume they're true. They might be true, but they also might not be true. However, if your sequence converges to a finite real number, this list of items will always be the case. In other words, you can factor numbers out of your limits. You can distribute limits across sums. You can distribute the limit across products. You can distribute limits across divisions as long as the bottom sequence doesn't go to zero. And you can move limits inside of powers. Right? So again, that, that kind of reminds you of your limit properties. But I just want you to know that those properties still work here. Right? That's very important that you know that. Because um, there are a lot of times uh, students get into a lot of trouble because of things like that. All the time where they just assume that some rule that they know in one context is just going to work when they go to the other context not always true so for this these rules happen to work if your sequence is convergent they do not work if it's not convergent and things like this actually don't work in general the limit is actually a very nice operation in that sense the limits distribute across everything right as long as the limit exists they distribute across everything very few things are that nice Another important concept, uh, the concept of a decreasing sequence. So there's going to come a point soon where we're going to need to be able to describe uh, when a sequence is getting smaller, meaning are the members of my list continually getting smaller? Is every new girl, the limit does not exist, yeah, <laughs> it's new girls. Uh, the, 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 uh, there's, it's going to be an important idea knowing when a sequence converges. We can use our calculus knowledge here to just say that if I can find the derivative of the formula, if that's less than zero, it will be decreasing, as well as just knowing uh, that a n plus one is less than a n, right? Um, so there are times when you, for example, a n equals one over n is decreasing since if I take one over n plus one, that's definitely less than one over n uh, because it's the, the larger denominator gives me a smaller fraction. Also, since a n prime would be minus one over n squared, which is negative, right? So there are a couple ways you can talk about whether a sequence is decreasing or not. Um, and those are the two most popular ways. Uh, show that when you plug in n equals one into the formula, you get something that's definitely less than if you had plugged in just n into the formula. Um, or just find the derivative. Uh, other phrases that you might see, non-increasing and non-decreasing, that, that just means a n plus one is less than or equal to a n, and a n plus one is greater than or equal to a n. And that's it for sequences. I told totally you it wouldn't be bad. Um, so, yeah. Sequence is just a list in a definite order. Um, uh, this is the notation for it. Uh, we care about infinite sequences. We care about whether they converge or not. Uh, knowing whether a sequence converges just means taking the limit. It is always the limit as you approach infinity. Never makes sense to say anything else. And if you get a finite real number from taking that limit, then it converges to that real number. Otherwise, it diverges. And um, you can't approach anything else because there are gaps, right? So it doesn't make sense to approach anything. Minus one to the end, an important concept. It gives us a way to alternate between minus one and one. And n factorial is also an important concept that's probably new to some of you. It's called the factorial. Um, for our purposes and for a while, it will only apply to positive integers. But then you start doing a class like complex analysis or some abstract math class, and it's going to apply to all real numbers. Um, but for now, it only, it's only defined for us on the non-negative integers. Zero factorial is one. And for any positive integer n, n factorial is just the product of all integers from one up to n. Uh, the factorial grows slower, much slower, uh, than the variable exponential. So you take an exponential function and you make the base itself also exp uh, a variable. Uh, that grows super fast. It'll grow faster than a factorial. 
And these properties hold for convergent sequences. So all your familiar nice limit properties that you have from Calc 1, you can assume they will work here uh, as long as your, your sequence converges and you're not doing some like a division by zero. Uh, knowing the sequence decreases is also important. Just means that the new terms, a n plus one, are always smaller than the previous terms, a n's. Uh, or you can, if it's a formula, you can describe it as, you can just take the derivative and show that it's always negative. Yeah, that's all we need to know for sequences. Uh, that's what we need to know to be able to be useful for series, which we will do next time. So we'll start series next time. We won't have obviously finish that topic because we'd have a lot of different approaches to go through. And, um, Whatever we get up to on Monday, that's what the test is going to be on on Friday. Um, anything else to say? I think that's it. Um, yeah, so we'll stop there. Um, unless there are any questions uh, remaining. Okay, all right. So um, we'll stop there. Uh, thank you for your attention. As always, I'll post the video and the notes and you guys can see it. If you have any other questions, you can uh, let me know via email. So tomorrow, uh, no quiz, just go to the recitation session and kind of ask about things that are giving you trouble. Just uh, uh, have a Q and A run by you guys. Okay, all right, you're welcome. I will, uh, I guess, see you guys in the next one. Ciao.